Welcome students. We're so glad you guys are here. George has lots to share with you tonight. It's gonna to be super awesome. Okay, okay. well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for coming to our uh, sixth night of um, speakers for our webinar series for Hispanic Heritage Month. I'm gonna hand it over to Maria real quick. Go ahead, Maria. Bienvenidos a todos al seminario virtual de Adelante Latinos. Para escuchar esta presentación en español, haga clic en el icono de interpretación, selección español para escucharla en su idioma. Muchas gracias. Y mi nombre es Maria, mucho gusto. Muchas gracias. Okay. So first, I just want to start with thank yous. Um, I've started every night with the thank yous. So thank you to all of these wonderful people that, whose names you're seeing, um, our student moderators, um, everybody you see here, thank you. We could not do any of this without you. Um, thank you to Glendale Latino Association. Um, they provided a little bit of uh, cash so we could uh, thank our speakers uh, with little teeny tiny presents. But um, we, we, we love you. And if you haven't joined Glendale Latino Association, please consider doing so, as well as Adelante Latinos. Um, go ahead, build to the next slide. Uh, we have a strategic planning committee for Adelante Latinos. And our next one is Saturday, November 21st. Please put that on your calendar. We would love to have you. It's gonna be via Zoom again. And you can come and help us uh, learn how to support all of our Latino students here in Glendale Unified. Go ahead, Bill. Um, please make a note of our social media. We have email, we have a website, we have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We have our own YouTube channel. Um, mm -hmm. which you are able to see any of our previous speakers. Our recordings are up on our YouTube channel, so you are welcome to see that there. And tonight, um, we're going to be putting up on the social media, the, um, I think it's the city of Pasadena. Yeah, the Pasadena Tournament of Roses, which if you were here last week, you would have heard the president speak. Um, but there is a Dia de los Muertos art contest and the entries are due the 28th. Um, so we will be putting that information up on our social media tonight. So make sure you check that out if you're a budding artist or not, if you just wanna give it a shot. Um, these, this here, these are the links to our previous speakers and their recordings. Go ahead, Mr. Galmore. And tonight, we are thankful to have from Glendale High School, Miyako Yuba as our student moderator. And I want to thank Mr. Galmore, Mr. Hernandez, for being our illustrious stage crew, keeping us afloat uh, during all these presentations. So go ahead, Miyako, take it away. How do you um, yes. yes, sir. Is there a way to uh, to show the students on the screen? We don't see them. No, we don't have that ability through the webinar. Oh, okay. But we might be able to hear their voices at the end. We could do that too. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead, Miyako. George Pla, President and CEO of Cordoba Corporation. George L. Plott is a successful entrepreneur, best-selling author, and philanthropist whose work spans business and civic activities that hold the common theme of enhancing communities throughout California. He is the founder and CEO of Cordova Corporation, a statewide full-service engineering firm specializing in the delivery of infrastructure projects in transportation, education, water, and energy sectors. For nearly 40 years, Cordova Corporation has worked on complex, infrastructure projects throughout California. Cordova Corporation has been recognized by Engineering News Record as one of the top 50 program management firms and one of the top 100 construction management firms in the nation, as well as a California top design firm. George Pla, a history of George's founding of Cordova Corporation and his philosophy of leadership is recorded in a curriculum-based case study authored by the Harvard Business School. George is the co-author of the formative book on Latino politics, Power Shift, 
how Latinos in California transformed politics in America. PowerShift recounts the origins and development of 10 Los Angeles Latino leaders who transformed politics and government, forging a progressive political tradition in the process. While the perspective focuses on Latino politics, PowerShift at its core is a story of the American dream that resonates across cultures and communities. George is currently working on two follow-up books that will constitute the PowerShift trilogy, along with a documentary and an institute plan at California State University, Los Angeles. George is a graduate of Cal State LA and holds a Master of Public Administration from USC. Do you have any questions? Let's see. Okay, you're on, you're on, George. Oh, very good. Is everyone still awake? Yeah. <laughs> very good. Uh, first of all, before I, I get started uh, formally, uh, I have to make a comment about COVID and remind all of you to take it very seriously. Don't listen to the politicians, listen to the medical experts. Uh, it's something that's uh, really on my mind day and night. Secondly, I really want to thank Ms. Benitez. Uh, for you students, this is a lot of work to put together. And I do hope that you will appreciate and applaud her and her team for everything they've done. These are not platitudes. It's something that I'm aware of what it takes to do this. In my interviews for the books that we're writing, one of the things that stands out really loud and clear is the influence that a teacher has on a student. Uh, these individuals we're writing about are very accomplished state, national, international leaders. And what do they tell me? It was a teacher in the 12th grade. It was a teacher in the 10th grade that inspired me, that directed me, that yelled at me to uh, get my act together. So I hope when you see Ms. Benitez that you will uh, thank her for all the work that she's put into this. Also, with respect to that introduction that I appreciate, uh, it's kind of hard to take and maybe difficult to understand. So if I may, I'd like to give you my own introduction. It's a little different. And I want you to think about, even though I can't see you, uh, whether or not you can relate at all to how I'm going to introduce myself and how that might relate to you personally. Uh, I came here from Jerez Zacatecas uh, undocumented. I came across the border in the middle of the night under the skirts of my aunt into Los Angeles, a community called Boyle Heights in East LA, which is known as the Ellis Island uh, of Los Angeles. Ellis Island being the point of entry in New York where all the immigrants came years ago. Uh, I don't think my story is that different than yours. I don't think it's that different from 1955, which is a very long time ago, to the year 2020. I think the story of this region is the same. We're a land of immigrants. We're, it's a land of opportunity. It's up to us what we decide to make of it or, or not. Uh, in my time, the points of entry for me out of East LA was fortunately to go to a community college, East Los Angeles College, and then transfer to Cal State LA, and fortunately get to USC and get my master's. But it's a, it's a pay as you go, you work, you commute, and uh, do the best that you can. And I think in many instances, the situation in 2020 is really you know, not that different. So that I think is a better introduction of, of me. You see photos there um, that I think are, are humbling uh, given my beginnings that I think are resemble, I think your, your beginnings. Uh, California, Southern California, United States is a land of opportunity. It's whatever you want to make it. And uh, Cordova Corporation that you see on here, it's not so much bragging about this giant company that does all these great things. 
It's really more about the entrepreneurial spirit. What is possible? California is a state where Apple was created, where Netflix was created. Uh, Cordoba Corp started out of my living room. No money, no partners, no business plan, no furniture, no office. Just the power of an idea. And that's not to be immodest about it, it's to share with you what's possible. And so what you see on the screen, all these great accolades of Cordova Corporation that I'm proud of, it's just the power of an idea. And uh, in California, in Southern California, there are those of you in this classroom that have similar dreams and aspirations. And there's just no reason why you can't achieve that, especially here in, uh, in California. So it's really more about the entrepreneurial spirit, more about the dreams, and more about what's, what is possible. When you look at the next slide, uh, ideas. Well, ideas typically come from uh, the schools that you're at now, you're in K through 12, and then the universities. And uh, these are universities that we partner with. Uh, some of them uh, you're familiar with, some of them you're not. Uh, it's not an exhaustive list. I mean, Cal Poly Pomona, Cal State Northridge, all of the schools in the area we partner with because it's a, it's a bedrock of ideas. And I hope that all of you will think about, well, what university do I want to go to? What is that university about? How can I get there? How can I afford to get there? What kind of grades do I need? What kind of tests do I need to take? Some of you are well on your way in doing so, and some of you are not. And I would uh, submit to you that think about these institutions and where you ought to be and what is possible for you. There's a lot of preparation, and uh, if you're not doing it already, you need to get started. So I just want to share with you the, the universities that we partner with. Uh, we like to say at Cordoba, make a difference where you live and where you work. As you look at the photograph, you're going to see that we represent California, that it's men and women of all colors and all persuasions. And uh, it's not so much about social justice, which is the topic of the day. It's more about do you reflect the communities you work in? And because we do, I think it's in large measure why Cordova is, is so successful. But we have very defined programs within the company that help our employees, our students, our interns be successful. The Blueprint for Success is an internal training program to get our engineers, our professionals out of the cubicle and have a broader perspective on the projects that we work on. Pathway to success is something we just created a few months ago. Uh, everyone's talking about social justice, social justice. Well, our interpretation of that is we need to create jobs for people. So we created Pathway to Success to select census tracts where you have high unemployment, bring them in, put them in a training program, and make sure they have a job at the end of that rainbow. We pay them along the way and they will be absorbed within our workforce, and we're glad to be proud of that. Because either people, my view of social justice is, is that they need a job. And if they have a job, they can take care of a lot, lot of issues. And that's exactly what Pathways is intended to do. Our internship program is quite large. We typically have 20, 25 interns every year. We pay them. A lot of internships are not paid. We pay them and we integrate them into our teams. They don't make coffee, they don't Xerox, I think Xerox is a, an old word. They don't make copies. Uh, they are integrated in a serious part of the, our, our teams as well. The Somali Scholars is a, is a high school program. I wasn't sure high school kids could hang in what we do at Cordova Corporation, but I was wrong. High school students are very bright, uh, top left are uh, four high school students that are here, and man, oh man, they make a big contribution to the teams that we work on. So we're very proud about being a member of the community, giving back to the community, and reflecting the communities that we work in. That's what this, state, this uh, page is all about. Um, 
power shift. You heard about the book in the introduction. I mean, what, what does that have to do with uh, your company, George, and what's the connection to it? Well, it occurred to me that you students, as you learn about your history, uh, whether it was you know first grade, second grade, third grade, or high school, you don't have very, very many role models to look at. I mean, you are for sure look at Abraham Lincoln and you look at George Washington and maybe, maybe, maybe Cesar Chavez, but then it kind of stops there. So the intent of PowerShift is to uh, record historical achievements of incredible Latino, Latina leaders that have made a contribution, not only in California, but in the nation. And uh, we will be sure to send you copies of these books if you're interested. Uh, it's a textbook that's being taught in the colleges, universities. But the intent is that you would read about historical figures uh, that have made enormous contributions that just happen to be Latino and Latina. I think our young people deserve that. Uh, we are going to continue to work to get this book in the curriculum in K through 12 community colleges, state colleges and universities. Uh, PowerShift 2 is in the works now as we speak. And uh, I happen to think it's even going to be better than the first one. We're gonna show you a very brief video of Mayor Garcetti and what he thinks about this book, PowerShift. Everybody needs to read PowerShift. Um, not just Latinos, this is American history, an important part of a universal story that we've all had and our families have had of struggle and overcoming struggle, of finding one another and building on the victories that we find around us. This is an amazing story of 10 narratives, 10 family stories, 10 individual stories, but it is part of our universal American story and it should be required reading for all of us. Thanks to Mayor Garcetti for, uh, for doing that. It's quite an endorsement and we're very proud of that. I then uh, won't start the video just yet. Everybody needs. And that, that is that um, I talked a few minutes ago about giving back and being part of the community. Well, Los Angeles had an opportunity to bring the space shuttle endeavor to Los Angeles. But NASA said to the California Science Center, of where I am uh, on the Board of Trustees, show us, prove to us that you can move this national treasure through the urban streets of Los Angeles. It had never been done before in the history of the United States or the history of NASA. And uh, I just want to tell you that when we made the presentation to NASA to show them, prove to them that we could move the space shuttle to the, through the streets. Uh, I just have to tell you how it was. I looked over at our team, and let me tell you the names of our team. Roberto Ramirez, Cariña Duenas, uh, Joe Villa, and so many more. And I just so immensely proud when they just presented to these NASA astronauts and engineers of how we were going to do that. After you see the video, I have to tell you a story about the young people's input and the Toyota truck. Let's show the video.
wish that all of you could, I wish I could see your reaction to this video because it's quite moving. I want to spend a couple of minutes on it for all of you. I think that you would be amazed. The project manager, Roberto Ramirez, today still gets teary-eyed when he watches this video because he spent two years coordinating 3,000 people in simulating this move over and over and over and over again. Roberto Ramirez is about five foot four. Looks like Cesar Chavez was a farm worker that picked crops up in the Sacramento area, got himself to Sac State, became an engineer. And then one day, he's the project manager of one of the most historic events in the history of the United States. And so it's, it's really quite moving. I want to tell you a story very quickly about uh, input decision-making and where uh, decisions come from sometimes. I, I think the conventional wisdom as wise and old people like me know everything and we make the decision. So let me tell you what happened with the space shuttle. Caltrans and the Highway Patrol called us and wanted to meet with us and told us that the route would be selected where they, they would not approve. There was a bridge that the space shuttle had to go over and they said it's too heavy and you can't, uh, with a transporter, it's not gonna make it and you can't pull it across. There was no other route possible but that bridge to bring the space shuttle over. And if we couldn't bring it over that bridge, the space shuttle was not gonna be moved. And my heart stopped and everybody froze. And, uh, and the reason for it is the weight, by the way, in case you're wondering, it, it, transporter and the space shuttle was too heavy. Uh, we thought it could, they disagreed, and we're at a standstill. And uh, picture a room of, uh, 10 astronauts, 10 engineers from NASA and our team. And we're all staring at each other, don't know what to do. And my heart stopped. And uh, this young man, maybe 22 years old at the end of the room, probably an intern said, why don't we use a Toyota truck? And everyone looked down the, the, the table like, are you, Pardon the word, but are you stupid or what? What do you mean the Toyota truck? He said, no, no, no. The truck weighs this much. It has this much torque. I think it, it meets the weight limit and it could pull it across. And nobody, not NASA, not anybody thought of that. And we called Toyota and said, is this true? They said, absolutely. I said, no, no, I want to talk to the engineers. Is this true that your Toyota truck can pull it across the bridge? Yes, sir. We've uh, tested it and we can do that. So they were terribly excited about it, so much so that I thought, huh, I know what they're going to do. They're going to make a commercial about the Toyota truck. So you know what I told them? I said, yeah, we'll let you use the truck, but you have to pay us $10 million. Not to me, to the science center. You have to pay us $10 million and we'll use your truck. And they wrote us a check like in two days. So the joke is I should have asked for more. Right? <laughs> so uh, that is where the Toyota truck idea came from. What's my point? My point is that in a meeting, in a group, you must be open and welcome anybody and everybody's ideas because you don't know where a good idea is going to come from. And I just want to share that with you, students and, and teachers and faculty for that, that matter. So um, that, uh, Ms. Benitez, is, uh, is our presentation. I hope uh, that is what you wanted. Uh, I'm really bummed that I, I'm not there in person because that's really a lot of fun to do. But I now uh, am open to any questions or comments. So uh, thank you, George and Miyako. Um, it looks like we have a, a few questions there in the Q&A. Uh, go ahead and, and get started. And if you have any questions, just type them in the Q&A. 
um, or raise a hand if you want to ask your question question in person. Okay. Um, hi. Um, Logan says, who inspired you? My inspiration came from my teachers and my coaches. Uh, they really uh, believe in me. They saw something I think I did not see. And uh, they were a huge inspiration because as much as I adore my mother and father, they just didn't have the experience, perspective, or resources to, to show me something bigger and better. So my teachers and my coaches were huge inspiration. Um, our next question is from Sandra. She asked, what do you think are some of the challenges exist now that were not faced before? By students? Um, they didn't say, <laughs> didn't say who, but I'm guessing yes. I would expect that the challenges of, at the moment, of course, is the pandemic and working remote and doing all of that. I mean, obviously, that's an immediate challenge. I know it's a challenge to some of our distressed communities that may not have the equipment, the parents have to work or parents are out of work. Uh, it's got to be just a, an incredible uh, challenge today. Now, the larger challenges are, are pretty straightforward. We've got to have accessibility to education. We've got to have affordability to education. We have to insist that the quality of education is what it should be. Uh, we all know historically that in minority communities, it's not been the case. And leaders, teachers, administrators, parents have to insist on that. And uh, I have said too many times, education is the great equalizer. Um, next question is from Mia. What kept you motivated? I, uh, I just believe in the human spirit. I believe in the potential of the human spirit. And uh, I'm always uh, not only pushing myself, but my friends, colleagues, family to do better. Uh, I think there's so much potential. There's so many resources, especially in California, that there is no excuse to not move forward. I do not understand any human being that tells me I'm bored. I do not get that. I do not understand being bored. How could you possibly be bored with everything that's around you? Um, this is kind of, I'm combining two of those questions together. Um, what made you found, found Cordova Corporation and what was, what's its major goal for the company? The, the motivation to, to start Cordova, the traditional answer should be I wanted to create a business and make money. That was not the case. When you study founders of organizations, including businesses, real founders, they did, money was not the motivator. They wanted to create an organization that would make an impact. I am not claiming to be Steve Jobs or Walt Disney, but they didn't create uh, Apple and Walt Disney for money. And Cordoba Corp is no different. I wanted to create an organization that would have an impact in the communities, that would create jobs, that would develop infrastructure, meaning schools, water, energy transportation systems for the benefit of the communities that we live in and where we work. And so uh, that was the inspiration behind it. And uh, I actually feel honored that I get to do this. But money was not the motivator, and that kind of messes people up because they think that's the reason and it's not. I understand it, and it follows, but that's not the that's not the reason why we did this. Um, next question is from Rachel. Uh, were you scared to move the plane? No, I wasn't. Uh, my friends call me a Forrest Gump, like I don't know any better. And uh, I knew it's something we had to do. I believe in our team and what had to be done. But uh, Rachel, you have a good question. There was people in City Hall that we had to work with, Department of Water and Power, 
Department of Transportation, they, they want nothing to do with it. Uh, there's a company called Parsons Corporation in Pasadena that's huge. They walked away. They didn't think it could be done. But I never doubted that we could do that. And it's more than positive thinking. It's can we put the right team together and really dedicate ourselves to making sure that this will be successful? I was telling you about Roberto Ramirez. He put an awesome team together and it was very successful. And some people were surprised and some people were not. Um, this is from Anonymous, but uh, what are some goals for your future? I think we continue to grow Cordoba Corp in a way that, get, that provides capacity to do greater things. Uh, we have serious problems in air quality, in water quality, in transportation, in mobility. Uh, we have problems in creating jobs for those uh, that are unemployed. I think Cordoba Corp can play a role in that directly and indirectly. And uh, people, uh, what people usually ask me is, are you gonna retire and are you gonna sell Cordoba? Uh, a, I'm not gonna retire, they'll have to carry me out of the building. And B, I will never sell Cordoba because I think we're onto something special. Um, our next question is from Kate. How long did it take you to write Power Shift and um, were there any influential people that assisted you in the process? The power shift one took us five years, uh, probably longer. Uh, the truth is we didn't know what we were doing. We've never done it before. Uh, it's quite a process we've learned about publishers and editors and printers and graphic artists. I mean, that's all besides the subject matter that we wanted to convey. Uh, so it took a little more than five years. Uh, we had an incredible team put together, and uh, Smithsonian Institute was very influential. Uh, Berkeley was very influential in, in helping us shape this. But more importantly was the dedication, the passion of our team, our, my co-author, our publisher, our editor, our project manager, were unbelievable. Now, our shift two, which we're in the middle of, we will have it done in a year and a half. So we kind of know what we're doing nowadays. And by the way, there'll be Power Shift 3, which will be a national book. Um, our next question is from Rachel. Did you have good friends there to help you? I have had good friends my entire life since I can ever remember. I'm very grateful to them and I'm very loyal to them. Um, you can't possibly do any of this by yourself. Uh, I get way too much credit. I'm not being modest. I get way too much credit for the things that we've accomplished. If any of you, and you are welcome to visit, should, would come to our uh, senior staff meeting and see the sheer talent of people that are in one location to move these big agendas, whether it's the space shuttle or the book or Cordoba or anything else. Uh, it's just a tremendous collective effort, and uh, I am not being humble about that. I, what I am proud of is the ability to create a culture, create a vision where people can really thrive, and believe me, they do. Um, our next question is from Anonymous. Um, what was the best quote anyone has ever told you that changed the way you looked at the world? Ah, what a question. Uh, I was really touched by the gentleman that wrote the foreword for the book. His name is Leon Panetta. Now check this out, everyone. Leon Panetta was the Secretary of Defense. He was the CIA director, and he was Chief of Staff to President Clinton. And the foreword that he wrote for our book said, this story must be written and must be read because it's an American story. It's the American dream. And by the way, the struggle's not over. We have to continue to labor forward to make this American dream a reality. That really moved me. Uh, it's a friend, he's a friend of mine, but for him to be that thoughtful about something we were doing was very, very moving to me. 
and frankly inspired me to go on to book two and book three. Um, yeah. Looks like we don't have any questions right now, but I, I actually do have a question for you. Um, what kind of advice would you give to young people like, um, you know, as me, you know, my mom came to America when she was younger and she didn't get the opportunities as much as um, she'd like. So she always encourages me to, you know, do my work, do good in school. So what would you, what advice would you give me? I would give you and all the students the following advice. And I've asked this question a lot, by the way, so I kind of know the answer right away. Uh, I'm going to tell you all three words, three words. And if you have anything to write down, I want you to write it down. Are you all ready? It's focus, discipline, and consistency. And I would ask you, what's the most difficult one? Write down. I can't see it, but write down what you think is the most difficult one of the three. And I'm gonna tell you the answer, it's consistency. Because we say we're gonna lose weight. We say we're gonna get in shape. And, uh, and we're determined that we're gonna do that. And then stuff happens. And you go up and you go down and you go up and you go down. Focus, discipline, and consistency. If you practice that, you will do very, very, very well. I grant you that it's difficult, but I guarantee you that you'll be successful. I am not the brightest person in the room ever, but I, but I could tell you this, I mostly always will outwork everyone in the room. And that's, uh, that's not being very modest, but that you can count on me that I will outwork everybody. Yes, that I know how to do. Our next question is, do you see an increase in women in these yeah, types of careers? Say that again. Do you see an increase in women in these types of careers? Oh my goodness. Uh, in questions and answers, these questions are called softballs. You just threw me a big softball. At Cordoba, uh, nearly 40% of our entire work workforce of 427 employees are all women. The women at all levels. Before anybody asks me that question. At all levels, women are here because that is what's coming out of the colleges. I don't know what's happening with males. But when you look at graduations in colleges, the majority of them are, are women. And so the women are really populating not only the colleges, but the workforce. And it's company like us that welcome that wholeheartedly because the community, I keep talking about reflecting the community you work in, but what does it look like? And uh, I think women have a tremendous opportunity today to be successful, but you got to prepare yourself. Focus, discipline, consistency, get yourself in school, get yourself through school, get yourself out of school, and get yourself ready. Now, I want to make a comment about college and, and advanced education. No, college is not for everybody. No, 100% of you don't have to go to college. No, you're not gonna fail if you don't go to college. I'm not saying that. I am saying advanced training, whatever it is. There's occupational skills. There's uh, uh, training and certificated programs. And then yes, there are colleges. What I would say about all of that is it is not an intelligence test. It's an endurance test. Can you power yourself through it? Can you be disciplined? to work through all the obstacles that you have, paying for it, commuting for it, studying, dealing with your families, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Can you work yourself through it? Now, I have been around long enough to watch over and over and over again that you can and you will do that. And I, you know, this is really corny, but I think it's up to you. Um, what advice would you give to your younger self now? Advice what? What, advi what advice would you give to your younger self? 
younger self. Younger. Your younger self. When you were younger. Yeah. To myself. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow, that is a very good question. What advice would I give myself? I don't know. It's difficult for me because I max every second, every hour, every day, all the time. I did it in elementary school. I did it in junior high, high school, college. Uh, I, I would have told myself what I did, and that is keep going, work hard, don't stop, don't hesitate. Um, but I practiced that. And uh, I actually make people crazy. Uh, when I walk around the buildings around here, people hide from me because they owe me stuff. They, they got to get things done and they know that. And so I kind of make them crazy, you know, pushing them forward because I think they have more potential than they think they have. And I'm going to get it out of them. And I do. Um, how do you define success? Success now at my age, uh, many of you students would think I'm going to be rich. I'm going to make money. I'm going to buy a mansion. I'm going to buy a Mercedes. That's not success. Those are byproducts. Success is to truly be happy in what you're doing, to truly treasure what you have now and what you aspire to be and to do. And they say in another corn expression, it's not the end game, it's the journey. And uh, success is, you know, really reach and search yourself. What makes you happy? What do you really want to do? Don't let other people tell you what that is. You figure out what it is. And uh, that in the end will make you happy. People keep asking me, well, why don't you retire? Why do you work so hard? It's not work. I love what I do. I can't wait to get here. And you have to find what that is for yourself. What do you really love to do? Have you figured it out at your young age? No, you haven't. But there are passions and dreams that you have. You've got to pursue that. That's what makes you happy. It's not material things. Um, what are some things you wish you did differently in school? I did not, and I've heard this a lot from people that, uh, that have been successful. Unfortunately, uh, many of us, for many reasons, did not learn how to study. We didn't know how to study for a lot of reasons your own reasons and your family reasons. And uh, I would urge all of you to really knuckle down and learn how to study. Uh, it's a discipline that you must master in high school, in college, and in your work. Study and really know what the heck you're talking about. The truth is that, uh, and I have to tell you, I was an athlete and I was real popular. And you know what, I, I try to skate by, I try to fake it. And many times I got by for all those reasons, but it didn't, it, didn't, it didn't end well. And I would urge everyone to learn how to study. In what ways can young people change or affect the representation of people of Hispanic Latinx heritage in mainstream culture? Well, I think it, it's, uh, you know, one, one person at a time being successful in what you want to do. Uh, demonstrating, not for others, but for yourself, that you got yourself an education, you got yourself a good job, you are, are uh, contributing not only within your family, but outside your family. I think when people see that and notice that, they're going to have a different perception and away from the stereotypes and misperceptions of what, like, what uh, the stereotypes are of Latinos, Latinas. I think power shift is going a long way to dispel those notions. But I mean, that's only one vehicle. There's a lot of other ways uh, to do that. But I, I really believe that it's you, the individual, personally, that shows what you can do, uh, how impactful you can be. And that'll begin to change the perception and the stereotypes of Latinos and Latinas. And I think it has, I think it's begun. 
I think uh, young people now coming out of the colleges, going into the professions are having an enormous. Um, how were the people selected from the larger group for power shift? Uh, we measure impact, you know, we, they have cool stories to tell and they're very heartwarming and they pull your strings and, and it's amazing what they accomplish, but it's really, what impact did you have? Uh, I'll give you two examples that are very visible today. If you don't know them, look them up because there's so much out there. Uh, Alex Padilla is our Secretary of State. Uh, he uh, grew up in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, poor parents, mother uh, was a housekeeper. Father was a cook in a little restaurant. He got himself to MIT. He's now the Secretary of State. He's responsible for the vote by mail that's in the news a lot nationally. And he's responsible for the census, two huge issues in California and in this nation. And Alex Padilla is responsible for that. So he's in the book because he has, he will have major impact. Javier Becerra, out of Sacramento, son of uh, uh, farm workers, immigrants, uh, goes to Stanford Law becomes a US congressman, now is the Attorney General of California. He has sued the President of the United States like 90 times on issues that affect our community. And guess what, he's winning. Major impact. And so uh, some people might say, oh, well, you know, George maybe is picking his friends. No, I'm picking people, uh, we are selecting people that have major impact, not only in the Latino community, but in all communities. And that's how and why they're selected. And more important than that is for you, the students, to read about them and know about them. And that's important. Um, what's next for people of Hispanic chefs, Latinx heritage? What do, you, what do you think? I think it's wide open. I think uh, California in particular, uh, the economy is so diverse, the opportunities are so diverse that you all can go in any number of directions. You can go in academia, you can go in business, you can go in uh, entertainment and sports. It's wide open. And, uh, you know, if any of you, you know, are not successful, it's because you're not trying hard enough, because you don't have goals and aspirations, because you're not reaching out to others to help you along. It's wide open. And I think the responsibility is not others. I don't think we need to blame anybody else or make excuses. I think it's up to us ourselves. And it's wide open, the resources are there, the opportunities are there. You know, with the United States with all its faults, remember I'm an immigrant and I came here undocumented. But this country with all its faults is still the land of opportunity. And I will say over and over again, I think it's up to us. Um. Does anybody in the audience have any questions? You guys can raise your hands. Do you guys have any questions? I'll wait a little bit and see if anyone has. Oh. Um, do you believe that COVID-19 will have a drastic impact on the way you conduct your business over the next decade? Not in, uh, it, it has had a drastic impact on all businesses, especially small businesses. It's very sad. Uh, businesses closing, people losing their jobs. Um, ironically, and it's almost embarrassing to tell you all that Cordova Corp will have the best year ever in the middle of the pandemic. Why in the world is that? The reason is that two years ago, we invested in a lot of technology. We started having alternate work schedules. We started working remotely already. So when the pandemic hit, we were ready. And we also said two things. The very first day, you will be safe and you will have a job. And I think everybody calmed down. And, uh, and let's tell you something, uh, Randy, our IT director is here with me. He tells me that uh, the, the data shows that our people are more productive remotely than in the office. And so that is a new way of working. I mean, I don't recommend it for teaching, Ms. Benitez, but um, 
in our case, uh, we've been incredibly productive. We were very prepared. Our competitors were not. And uh, man, we're, we're going to have the best year ever. Now, having said that, the workplace is going to be different than it was before. We will have remote uh, people working remotely. We will have alternative schedules, and we should. And it's a good way to ease traffic congestion, air quality, and all of those things. So I'm pretty proud of Cordova being at the forefront of, of this. But if you notice from my whole conversation, we're not whiners. You know, we, we go forward. We think ahead and we work hard at it. Um, I think this is going to be our last question. How do you ensure that Cordova is being sustainable for the environment? Oh, well, I mean, in all the work that we do, uh, the environmental issues are a factor into our project management plan. So we have done that since 1983. Uh, right now, it's kind of the flavor of the month about climate change and environmental. We've been doing it for 35 years. And uh, it's just part and parcel of having grown up in East LA, having the most freeways ever in, in East Los Angeles, schools being located by refineries, schools being located by airports. We know all that. We grew up here, we're from here. You know, when people say, where are you from? Where are you from? Well, I'm from here. And we know what those issues are. And as we develop our project management plans, we factor that in. We do a great deal of work with air quality management district. Uh, and so it's, it's something that isn't new for us. It's, it's something that we think about a lot. Yesterday, I had a conversation about renewable energy. What does that mean? How does Cordova prepare for that? What is hydrogen? What is electrification? And how are we gonna be ready for that? Well, we will be because I think we're a company of thinkers. That's who we are. Yeah, and I saw the name Anita Gabrillion on there. I really want to say hi to her, give a shout out. She's been a dear friend of mine. And by the way, been very supportive in everything and anything Cordova has ever done. Miyako, you mentioned, you know, have friends help you. Well, Anita's been one of those people. And I have to make sure you all understand that. George, I have my hand up and I just want to say how incredibly excited I am that you took this opportunity. I, I knew that you would because you are all about opportunities for others and great advice and uh, self-sufficiency. I think it's been a treat and it will be a treat for all the students who will continue to listen to this tape. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. And George, thank you so much. Um, our time is coming to a close here. Um, thank you for being an amazing role model for our students. Um, Miyako, you did a great job. I have you asked did. questions. Way to go, Dynamiters. Uh, that's hard for me to say because, you know, I'm a Falcon, but <laughs> you did DHS very proud tonight. So good job. Um, so thank you all for coming. Remember that we have four more. There's only four more opportunities. Um, we have Christina Perez, known as Judge Christina, on Monday. We have Marcela Solorio, who is the ambassador from Mexico to LA, LA on Thursday next week. And then our final week, we have Davina Agudelo and Alejandro Pargon. So um, please join us. Um, I know you guys are getting as much out of it as I am. Um, it's just been five weeks of inspiration. This is the, um, the poster that I wasn't able to get into my PowerPoint earlier. So thank you to Mr. Gallimore. This is the Dia de los Muertos, um, a celebration of art. It's a competition. Everything is due up, um, by October 28th. And we will put it on our social media so you guys will have access to it. Um, if you want to share this presentation with anyone, please let them know that we recorded it. And it's available on our social media and on our YouTube channel. Thanks to you, everyone. Have a wonderful, safe weekend. Thank you, George. We appreciate it so much. Uh, thank you to your assistant, Seda, um, who has been wonderful in communication with us. Um, and Randy. And Randy, yes, Randy, who is, who is your, your uh, backstage guy. So thank you to everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Good night.
Nice. Go Trojans. Ah. Go Buckeyes. Right on.